Hi, I'm Peter J. Ray. Welcome. Today's topic is John Quincy Adams, Part 6. Today we're going to wrap up the life of, of John Quincy Adams. We stopped last time in 1840. Uh, his life, wife, Louisa, was depressed. Uh, she'd had 12 pregnancies, 7 miscarriages, 1 stillborn child. And uh, her oldest son, George, had committed suicide in 1828. Um, she... Um, she was trying to figure out what, what she could do to feel better, and she decided to buy and free a slave who was a female cook. And she wrote, she was, quote, almost as glad as if, a, a, as if I was buying my own freedom. She had this to say about the White House, quote, There is something in this great unsocial house which depresses my spirits beyond expression and makes it impossible for me to feel at home or to fancy that I have a home anywhere. That same year, in 1840, uh, John Quincy was asked by abolitionists abolitionist to defend the Amistad prisoners, these fellows, these uh, slaves, African slaves that had been uh, originally were in Cuba and then wound up in prison in, in Connecticut. It became a Supreme Court case. And, you know, the Cubans were saying, or the Spanish were saying, oh, these should be returned to Cuba. And these abolitionists wanted them to be freed. And uh, John Quincy responded to this uh, request, quote, I endeavor to excuse myself upon the plea of my age, he was 73, and inefficiency after a lapse of more than 30 years. They urged me so much and represented the case of those unfortunate men as a case of life and death that I yielded. So he was going to be a lawyer again. Well, actually, the, you know, he did practice law so somewhat, not a great deal, and never enjoyed it, but this this case, he, he got involved in, and it was the greatest case of his life, really. In February of 1841, the Amistad trial started. And entering the courtroom, John Quincy Adams felt his only resource was a, quote, fervent prayer that presence of mind may not utterly fail me at the trial I am about to go through. In his opening argument, he said this, quote, I appeal to plead the cause of justice and now of liberty and life in behalf of many of my fellow men. And then the trial didn't last too long, and his, on the last day of the trial, he, he made his closing argument, quote, In taking then my final leave of this bar and of this honorable court, I can only ejaculate a fervent petition to heaven that every member of it may go to his final account with as little of earthly frailty to answer for as those illustrious dead. Now, he was referring to the former Supreme Court Chief, uh, Supreme Court justices who had died. And that you may, every one, after the close of a long and virtuous career in this world, be received at the portals of the next with the approving sentence, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. <laughs> so he was talking about, you know, he was talking about these referring to their deaths, you know, we're all going to die. And he was talking about how hopefully they would all, you know, be welcomed in heaven. And so this was kind of a, this was a dramatic uh, ending to his, his argument. And uh, I think it had, it had an impact. And March 9th, the verdict was announced that there was, fr the Amistad prisoners were freed. They would be freed. And uh, they, were, they were allowed to go back to Africa. I believe they ended up in Sierra Leone, which was a place that the British established after the slave trade had been banned. Sierra Leone was established for uh, when the British would capture sh uh, slave ships, and you know they really couldn't take them back to their homes. And um, uh, and you know if they lived fairly near, maybe they could make their ways make make their way from Sierra Leone back to their home. Now the Amistad prisoners, I don't know. I believe they. They were, they were sent to Sierra Leone. I don't know if they ever got back to their own homes because, you know, Africa is a, is a pretty big place. So anyway, this was a great victory for uh, John Quincy Adams. He, he won the case, and the Amistad prisoners were freed. 1840 had been an election year, and the new incoming president uh, who was elected was William Henry Harrison, and he only served uh, for a month because he died shortly, uh, you know, only a month into office. However... Uh, in 1841, during his brief uh, uh, time as president, he considered John Quincy Adams an old friend and almost a brother. That's what he would say. And at White House dinners, 
he would slap John Quincy on the back and ask John Quincy to make the first toast. In 1841, uh, John Quincy uh, recalled uh, visiting the British Museum in London when he, when he was a boy and seeing the Magna Carta. And one of the signers, he noticed, was a man named Sir de Quincy. And John Quincy wrote this quote, I said to myself, there is blood of that man, and there is blood of John Adams flowing in my veins. Therefore, he could not compromise with evil. He had to be a good guy. In 1839, John Quincy said this, quote, May I be permitted to inquire whether religion is not herself the child of education, and whether it would not, it would not be more proper to say that education was from its first origin the governing principle of the settlement of New England, or in other words, that education was the mother of New England. Jesus came to teach and not to compel. His law was a law of liberty. He left the human mind and human action free. Defective education requires obedience rather than freedom. An educated people will be a free people. In 1841, he had a he had an attack of boils on his scalp and loins, and uh, which uh, prevented so. But he kept going out to these various dinners and lectures and evening activities. Uh, to cover these boils, he wore a white. One time he wore a white turban. Another time he wore a silk cap with tassels. His son Charles wrote this quote: "It is singular that a man should find some sort of external excitement so essential for his health." So he kept going out even though he had these boils. In 1843, he was, he was photographed. This is the first time a president had, had been photographed. And that's the cover. That's the, the, photo, that's the picture we used in the, in the previous video. 1843, his, uh, his, gra his grandson Henry one day refused to go to school. And uh, John, heard this temper, John Quincy heard this temper tantrum. And uh, he knew exactly what was going on. He, didn't, he never said a word. He walked over, found uh, his, his grandson, and took him by the hand and uh, walked him to school and into his classroom to his seat. Never said a word. And uh, the boy was in awe of his grandfather. And this, this uh, boy became the famous historian, Henry Adams, years later. In 1843, Cincinnati in Ohio was building the, the first astronomical observatory in the United States. And John Quincy was invited to speak at the laying of the cornerstone because he had really been such a pioneer in promoting astronomy and had a great love of it. And, you know, his family was against him going because he was an old guy and uh, his health wasn't great. But he, he decided he wanted to go. And this was, was, this was some trip. He traveled overland to, to Buffalo and then uh, in New York and then took, uh, a, uh, took a ship to Cleveland, Ohio, and then a canal to the canal to Columbus, the Erie Canal, or the uh, not the Erie Canal, the Ohio Canal, and uh, and there were he was well known, and this became a very a wonderful trip because he was extremely popular in the North. The abolitionist movement was growing, and you know he was this strong uh, uh, spokesperson against slavery, and uh, he encountered African Americans on the trip who really loved him, were very grateful for what he was doing to try to end slavery. And he had this to say uh, dur during this trip, quote, The whole soul of every citizen must be devoted to improving the condition of this country and of mankind. In, in, uh, backing up a little bit, in, when he was in Utica, New York, he visited a female seminary, and they had a gathering for him. One of the trustees read, an, read extracts from his mother's published letters to his father and to him. And John Quincy openly sobbed. He's very touched by the words of his mother read out loud. On November 1, he had been in Cleveland, Ohio. There were public honors and salutations for him. As I said, he took the Ohio Canal south. Finally made it to Cincinnati. He, 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 the Ohio Canal went to, to the Ohio River, and then he took a steamboat to Cincinnati and gave a speech there. And he, he, in the speech, he referred to the progress of mankind he talked about the ancient Greeks, the ancient Romans, and then some of the great thinkers who had helped mankind to progress, including Nicholas Copernicus, Johannes Kepler, and Isaac Newton. 
He was extremely popular. Everywhere he went, these crowds were coming to see him. And uh, a historian, William J. Cooper, wrote this, quote, In John Quincy Adams, the people saw the continuity of their country. This sept septuagenarian was not only the literal son of a major founding father, he had actually known and spoken with George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, and James Monroe, founders all. Moreover, Washington, Madison, and Monroe, as well as his own father, had appointed him to office. No other living political figure possessed such a lineage. All those who came out knew they would never again have the chance to see and hear a man whose public career spanned the life of the nation. So he had, this was really something, you know, he, he was pretty disappointed and, you know, he was so unpopular and, uh, as president, but during this time he was extremely popular. Everywhere he went, people were excited to see John Quincy Adams. He was a national hero. However, uh, the trip was really too hard on him. When he got home, he was very sick and tired. Very tough trip. And he was, he was nervous, agitated, and had an erratic memory. Uh, and he, he wrote that during this time that any event, quote, scatters my thoughts into a cloud of confusion, and I cannot retain the memory of anything from day to day. Louisa wrote a letter to their son, Charles, and she wrote this quote, He will do nothing and take no care of himself, but lives in a state of perpetual excitement. So <laughs> after the trip, he was, uh, he was pretty uh, worn out. So, and again, he continued his fight against the gag rule, and again, he was censured. He had a five, made a five-day defense and, uh, in uh, opposing slavery. And Henry, Henry Wise called John Quincy Adams, quote, the acutest, the astutest, the archest enemy of Southern slavery that ever existed. Uh, now, by this time, uh, John Tyler was U.S. president, and Harlow, biographer Harlow Giles Unger wrote this quote, John Quincy Adams' popularity exceeded that of the president, and had he defended his beliefs as aggressively when he was president, he would certainly never have suffered the humiliation of defeat in his run for re-election, Few Americans knew or understood him as president. Almost every American now knew and understood him, indeed revered him, after his battle with Congress. And millions now listened to every word of the sage of Quincy. Hundreds lined up to see him, to hear his words, to try to talk to him as he walked about Washington, driving to and from the Capitol each day. Luminaries from all parts of the United States, Britain and Europe called at his home. Charles Dickens and his wife stopped for lunch, and Dick Dickens asked for John Quincy's autograph before leaving. John Quincy had emerged as one of the most celebrated and beloved personages in the Western world. In 1844, he finally succeeded in, in having the gag rule repealed, which meant that uh, the word slavery, slavery could be discussed in the House of Representatives, and this was a great, great victory for him because he'd worked so hard on it. And his response in December 2nd was, quote, Blessed, forever blessed be the name of God. However, his, his health was declining, and he also wrote at this time, he described himself as having, quote, a daily deepening consciousness of decay in body and mind, an unquenchable thirst for repose, yet a motive for clinging to public life, till the last of my public friends shall cast me off. These are my cares and sorrows. In 1842, Cherokee Indians in, uh, and Creek Indians in Georgia were forced to move west. Now, they, they had become farmers, and you know, so they, they had adopted the white man's ways, and John Quincy was opposed to their being moved west, and he wrote this quote, The expulsion of the southern tribes, not only from their hunting grounds, but from their own domain, from the possession of the soil acquired by their conversion, at our instance and under our persuasion, from the hunter to the agricultural state, from their planted lands, from their comfortable dwellings, from their domestic hearths and the sepulchres of their fathers, pledged by solemn treaties to their perpetual possession, they have been expelled by the rude hand of violence. So this, in 1842, John Quincy met Charles Dickens, we mentioned. He was the famous author of, of so many wonderful novels, including Oliver Twist and, and so forth. Uh, John Quincy wrote a poem in 1846. 
He wrote this, quote, From the recesses of my heart, resentment's bitter sting expel, expel. Bid all the fiends of hate depart, and love alone my bosom dwell. And remember, he'd had so much political fighting with others, and, you know, he was, this was a very honest a sentiment, and he was, he was struggling, you know, to, to overcome these resentments that he had against his political enemies. In the summer of 1846, he was 80 years old and still swimming in the Potomac River at dawn in the morning in summer. And he wrote this, quote, The recollection of the past is pleasing and melancholy. Not a soul now living will be here in 1924. That's the year my father was born. My own term, how soon it will close. Will prayers to God preserve the branches and shoots from my father's stock? What a phantasmagoria is human life. It was the, and on the 18th death, death anniversary of their son, George, Louisa wrote this, quote, Pardon, pardon, the sin of thy servant for deserting the children of my tenderest love for mere worldly purposes at that tender age when they most required a mother's watchful care. It was thy will to take both my cherished sons from me. So she was feeling real bad, you know, that they had left George and John when they were eight and six years old, respectively, when they went to Russia. Left them for, didn't see them for six years. In 1846, John Quincy had a stroke, and uh, he, he only made, he made a partial recovery, but he continued working. And in 1847, he attended the ceremony uh, for the corner, laying of the cornerstone for the Smithsonian building. In May, the planet Neptune was discovered, and John Quincy celebrated. He was very, very happy. However, he was also uh, you know, feeling bad about his declining health, and he wrote, quote, I am unable to put on my own clothes. He had partial paralysis. However, he could walk, lie down, and speak, and he still went to the House of Representatives every day, despite his... Uh, his uh, weakening condition. And he wrote this, quote, This can hardly be called life, but tis destiny ordained for me, and at which I ought not to repine. That I shall ever be better, I have scarce reason to expect. It disqualify, disqualifies me for all business. On, uh, in July of 1847, uh, uh, John Quincy and Louisa celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary. He, con he continued to enjoy reading uh, authors such as Herodotus from ancient Rome. Uh, that year, Louisa had a bad fall and hurt her face. John Quincy was in invited to lay the, to the ceremony and for, for the laying of the cornerstone for the Washington Monument, but he was unable to attend. And Abraham Lincoln was actually in Congress at this time, so they were, they were both served in Congress at, in the House at the same time. In 1848, on February 21, he had another stroke, and which turned out to be fatal. And he was on the House of he was he was on sitting in the he was sitting in the House of Representatives. He was at work. He collapsed on the floor, and uh, they were they didn't take him to the hospital. They didn't guess there was no hospital in in uh, Washington then. And so he was uh, he was brought to the the speaker's uh, the speaker's office where he spent uh, the, the next uh, two days before he died. And he called for Henry Clay, who, who came and saw him, and Cl Clay wept. And then his, actually he went, into a, he went into a coma, and by the time Louisa came, he was unconscious, and he never, he never regained consciousness. Uh, his last words reportedly were, quote, This is the end of earth. I am composed. And he died on February 23rd, at 7 p.m. in 1848, in the Speaker's office in the House of Representatives. His remains were brought to Quincy and placed in the vault in the church there. Uh, Louisa died three years later in 1851. Paul C. Nagel wrote this quote, Louisa died in Washington four years later, also from the effects of a stroke. She had grown increasingly frail after her husband's death, claiming exhaustion from 50 years of living with him. So he was uh, buried in this family vault and, uh, in, in Quincy at first. And later, uh, he was, his coffin was moved to the, to the Adams Crypt in the United First Parish Church, uh, along with his parents, in Quincy. 
and uh, along with his wife, Louisa, as well. He had a mischievous grandson. When they transferred the coffin years later, he had a grandson who was curious about what he looked like, and he was able to get the workmen to take the top, top off the coffin. And uh, there was a, there was gla- he was under, his body was under glass, and he noticed that uh, John Quincy had a short, stubby beard. And as they say, when people die, uh, your hair and, hair and nails grow for a few weeks, but phone calls taper off. <laughs> The, the death of John Quincy, uh, the news spread quickly in the country because of telegraph, and, uh, and that was the, you know, the, well, the beginning of the communication revolution, almost instantaneous communication. And his, uh, when they moved his body, when his body traveled north, I believe, I'm pretty sure by train, and it was a pilgrimage transporting a sacred relic, the 500-mile trip. Multitudes came to pay their respects. This was a big deal. Uh, in New York City, thousands lined the streets for a, while well, his body passed on a four-mile route to City Hall where his body lay in state. After his death, Theodore Parker, a Massachusetts Unitarian minister, wrote this about John Quincy Adams, quote, The slave has lost a champion who gained a new ardor and new strength the longer he fought. America has lost a man who loved her with his heart. Religion has lost a supporter. Freedom an unfailing friend. And mankind a noble vindicator of our inalienable rights. In 1891, the Adams family crypt there in Quincy was open to the public. It's a national shrine and it's, uh, it's unique because there, are, there you have the graves of two American presidents. The first parish church in Quincy, Massachusetts. Again, uh, John Quincy loved books. He said, he wrote this quote, To live without a Cicero and a Tacitus at hand seems to me as if it was a privation of one of my limbs. Another quote by John Quincy Adams, quote, Literature has been the charm of my life, and could I have carved out my own fortune to literature would my whole life have been devoted. I have been a lawyer for bread and a statesman at the call of my country. I think actually he enjoyed, you know, being a politician. Well, he wouldn't admit it. Uh, William Henry Harrison wrote this about John Quincy Adams, quote, It is said that he is stiff and abstracted in his opinions, which are drawn from books exclusively. John Patrick Diggins, another historian, wrote about John Quincy Adams, quote, John Quincy Adams, America's most learned president, knew seven languages. He impressed Alex de Tocqueville with his fluent French, read the classics in Latin and Greek, and stayed abreast of the latest developments in science. He saw himself as an educator as well as a philosopher, one who would lead public opinion rather than follow it. He favored conviction over compromise and preferred discipline to convenience, a rare president. And during, at one point he was having a meeting with a British ambassador with respect to the Oregon Territory, and they were having an argument. And that was, and so, and he said this quote, I do not know what you claim, nor what you do not claim. You claim India. You claim Africa. You claim perhaps a piece of the moon. No, I have not heard that you claim exclusively any part of the moon, but there is not a spot on this inhabitable globe that I could affirm you do not claim. Another story, John Quincy and, uh, and Josiah, Qu- John Quincy Adams and Josiah Quincy came to Harvard to see their friend, Justice, Chief Justice, or Supreme Court Justice, Joseph Story, teach. And Story had them both sit by him on the platform. And after he started his talk, both of them promptly fell asleep. And Story, Judge Story said to the students, quote, Gentlemen, you see before you a melancholy example of the evil effects of early rising. <laughs> so the, the students roared with laughter. Another quote by John Quincy Adams. Quote, Nature's God commands the slave to rise and on the oppressor's head to break his chain. Roll years of promise, rapidly roll round, till not a slave shall on this earth be found. Paul C. Nagel wrote this about John Quincy Adams. Quote, John Quincy Adams delighted in accompanying old friends on fishing expeditions. He enjoys singing songs in French with his granddaughters. And Harvard students cheered his lectures. Now, he had, he had major depression 
uh, which dogged him his entire life. Uh, and when Adams died in 1848, the, the public mourning exceeded anything previously seen in America. In the 19th century, only the death of Abraham Lincoln would elicit a greater display of national sorrow. Uh, he gave advice, John Quincy, to his son Charles regarding the, sl- the struggle against slavery. And he, he said this, quote, Proceed, persevere, never despair, don't give up the ship. That was a reference to this quote by James Lawrence, who died fighting the British, and then that became the motto of Oliver Perry in the War of 1812, fighting the British on Lake Erie. For this talk, I read five books, uh, including John Quincy Adams by Harlow Giles Unger, 2012, John Quincy Adams, American Visionary by Fred Kaplan, 2014, Dear Mr. President, John Quincy Adams, Letters from a Southern Planter's Son by Stephen Kroll, 2001, The Lost Founding Father, John Quincy Adams and the Transformation of American Politics by William J. Cooper, 2017. And finally, John Quincy Adams, A Public Life, A Private Life by Paul C. Nagel, 1997. So in conclusion, John Quincy Adams lived an amazing life, really something. Much of his life was in Europe, uh, you know, because his father was uh, the famous John Adams, looking for help for the American Revolution. John Quincy Adams served as U.S. ambassador to a number of countries, including the the Netherlands, Prussia, uh, Russia, and Great Britain. He, uh, he served one term. His, uh, he was a great champion of, for freedom, fighting slavery, a very brave man. And he did an awful lot for the Smithsonian Institute. I, fi- I find him very inspiring because of his, uh, because of all, everything, because he was so knowledgeable, his knowledge of the ancient Greeks and Romans. He was a good man. He was ahead of his time promoting astronomy and promoting inf- infrastructure for our country. God bless John Quincy Adams a man who served his country well. Next time we'll talk about Andrew Jackson, the seventh president of the United States. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. And hope you weren't bored to tears. And uh, hope you find a good history book to read. Live long and prosper. May the force be with you. And uh, take care and I'll see you next time.